<laughs> Look at you guys. Yeah. Look at y'all, the cool kids over there. No, no, you're not. You're not cool. All right, that's okay. <laughs> You're cool. That's right. You're cool. Um, you are absolutely cool. I love these guys, man. Y'all doing okay today? I really feel like we already got what we came here to get, um, but this is just going to be icing on the cake. Um, what we're going to be talking about is, so if you could just turn me down a little bit, Greg, I think I got too hot. Um, but before we do anything, I just want to let you know, obviously, our hearts are hurting and horrified at the same time about what's taking place in Israel. Um, and um, there's a lot to be said about that. There's a lot of thoughts about that. Um, this isn't a day to where we're going to start picking sides and splitting hairs. It's a very complicated issue. But we do have um, a couple that actually just moved from Bethlehem, and they're a part of our church. And they're sweet. And we had lunch, oddly. And it's just coincidentally, this past Thursday or something, we had a conversation. And I was asking about the complexities between Palestine and Israel. And um, it was interesting. And he said, you know, it's a very complicated thing because there's three factors. He said, number one, you have religion. But you also have the issue of politics. And then you blend those two together. And you also have an issue of culture. <laughs> and those three things are very difficult to separate. So it's a very complicated thing. But here's what I will say. Today, we are called to pray for Israel. Scripture says that. We're not taking sides. We're just saying yes to what the Bible is saying. And so when you have terrorists that are coming in under the darkness and taking little elderly women and little children and anybody in between and brutalizing them, striking terror... We don't stand for that. Scripture says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and darkness. And what you're seeing is you're seeing Satan at work. And we oppose the works of darkness regardless of what label it may wear. So, with that said, tonight, I'm asking you, because we're called as Christians to do this, and so you may have other plans, but I'm going to ask you to do what the Bible is telling us to do and to show up in this room, and we're going to pray for Israel. We're going to pray for our brothers and sisters in Israel and pray for our brothers and sisters in Palestine because the truth of the matter is, is there's a lot of wonderful, wonderful people that I personally know in Palestine that are wonderful, God-fearing Christian people. But we also know people in Jerusalem and Israel and throughout those parts that are also near and dear to our hearts. And I've been to that land, and I will tell you, the majority of those people are absolutely wonderful, but it just only takes a couple of bad apples, right, with a bad agenda, to really screw up the whole thing. And so um, we need to pray for the protection right now because um, there's innocent lives on both sides being taken. And so would you join me right now just to pray and then come back tonight at 6 o'clock for one hour? Can you devote that to the Lord? Okay, so let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you on the behalf of Israel. Lord, your word says that we, as your children who have been grafted into the promise Lord, this is going to be our home one day, your word says. We're going to worship Jesus in Jerusalem. King of kings, Lord of lords, you're going to bring restoration. There's going to be a new Jerusalem. There's going to be a new day. So, Lord, that's our home. And so, Lord, we pray for our brothers and our sisters. Lord, we pray for innocent lives. Lord, I thank you that you do not see sides. You see sons and daughters and those who don't know you. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't pick sides or see sides, but, Lord, that we would see that evil is evil and good is good. And so, Lord, we pray that good would outshine evil. Your word says that. And so, Lord, what I'm asking is as evil tries to penetrate and bring terror and strike uh, injustice into the innocent, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that every attempt and effort of the enemy right now to be able to do those things, Lord, by, and I enforce your authority, Jesus, right here in the name of Jesus, may it be turned right back onto them. Every trap that is laid out, may they fall into it instead. Lord, may the nation stand, and may every man, woman, boy, and girl, Lord, this may this be a spectacular moment in human history where we see the power of God in a way that we have never seen before, and that every eye will see, and that every tongue will confess that you you are God. You are God, and you are above all in Jesus' name. So we pray your protection and justice to come right now and deliver your people. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we all said together, amen. Amen. Oh, all right. I have about a 
14 seconds to be able to preach this sermon. But I'm not going to lollygag today because a lot of what we just prayed about and already what we've been doing throughout the course of this morning is we've been singing. But when we sing and we worship the Lord in spirit and truth, things happen. Chains break. The Lord is able to heal. We've been doing battle all morning long. But we've been called to be victorious. And we've also been called to share one another's burdens. And so it's a joy for us to do that. And so don't you ever feel like we're too busy for you because that is what we're called here to do. I mean, we're not called here to put on a good Sunday program. We're called here to love and shepherd you guys and to be able to be faithful, to, to cheer you on to your next step. And so what we're doing is we started a series last week. How many of y'all were here last week? Let me see a show of hands. All right, not bad, not bad. For those of you who didn't raise your hands, thanks for nothing. Uh, you should have been, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but we're so glad that you're finally here. But let me catch you up. We're in the series called Fix Your Thoughts. And so I encourage you to go back and listen to last week because like I shared, every single week kind of is going to build on the next week. And so I don't want you to come in here and go, what, what the heck's going on? So get caught up, but we're in week two of Fix Your Thoughts. And it's based upon this passage in Philippians where it says this. Now, dear brothers and sisters... One final thing. Paul is writing from prison, okay? He's writing from prison in a horrible situation, and he's writing this letter to encourage brothers and sisters like you and I who are going through persecution, going through hard times, going through desperate situations. And he says, fix your thoughts. Fix your thoughts. Now, of course, in the context of what he's talking about, he's talking about fix, in other words, put your focus, your thoughts on what is true, lovely, admirable, worthy of praise. But I also feel like the Lord is also allowing me to hijack that phrase and take it a little bit out of context, meaning we need to also repair our thoughts. And the way that we do that is focusing on what is true. But I want to clarify truth. We're not talking about truth being just being a set of facts that we agree with. To know the truth is to know Jesus, to know real truth, because he is truth. The Bible says that he is the way, he's the truth, and he's the life, and no one can come to the Father except through good works, through good behavior, voting the right way. No. Through him, him alone. Anybody who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. He's the way and the truth and the life. And so when we fix our thoughts on truth, what we're really doing is we're fixing our eyes on Jesus. And as we fix our eyes upon Jesus, you know what we're able to begin to do? We learn how to say yes to him in every single area of our lives. As we fix our eyes and our thoughts on what is true, then what we will be able to do is discern what is lovely, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, admirable, because the world offers a lot of things that says, oh, this is lovely. Oh, this is admirable. This is worthy of praise. But we know that those are counterfeits. When you know what is true, you walk in the light of truth, and you will be able to identify what is true. And by virtue of that, you'll be able to honestly recognize what's lovely, admirable, beautiful, and all of these wonderful things. And so he says, think about these things. These things are actually excellent and worthy of praise. But David, I'm going through a tough time. How do I do that? It almost sounds like the verse is telling us, just put your head in the sand and wish things away. It's not what Paul is saying. But what Paul seems to be inviting a son and a daughter this morning whose mind is tired, your spirit is worn out, you're freaking out, you don't know how you're going to take your next step, and I understand that. You're under attack this week. I know you have been. Um, I, I know that in my spirit. You've been under attack. You're desperate. You're anxious. You're struggling. What do we do with those feelings and these emotions? What Paul seems to be saying is that we have permission to know where our responsibility stops and where we allow the shoulders of the Lord to begin to carry the rest, where God goes, son, daughter, sweetheart, I, I, I know. Give them to me now. You just focus on what is true. What's true? He loves you. What's true? He cares for you. What's true? He will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. These are all scriptures, by the way. That's what's true. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest for your souls. I know you're tired. And part of the reason why we're tired is because we just don't walk in the truth of what he says we can have. 
We're trying to be good boys and girls. Have you ever, anybody in here trying to be a good boy and trying to be a good girl? It's just instinctive to us. We want to be bell ringers. We want to make the Lord proud. We want to make our families proud. We want to make our churches proud, whatever it may be. But if you do it from your own strength, you only got a limited resource, and then you're just like, I can't do this anymore. And so you get tired. You get worn out. You're like, man, I'm tired of trying to be good. I can't do this anymore. Well, guess what? Doesn't have to be that way. There's too many Christians walking around, worn out, tired, beat up from the world, and you're just like, man, I just need a break. Well, we're going to talk about that because the Lord wants to show you some very simple things that many of you all already know, but we may not be walking in as we fix our thoughts. Can we pray one more time? And with the remaining two minutes and 12 seconds I've got, let's get after it. Father, in Jesus' name, once again, come Holy Spirit. This is your word. And I'm asking, Lord, now that the revelation of your word would penetrate every mind and heart and soul online, on podcasts, and in this room. You love individuals. You don't love crowds. You love individuals. You love each and every person under the sound of my voice uniquely. And you are uniquely aware of the burdens that they carry, the fears that they struggle with, the deficits that they're walking in, the financial trouble, the health trouble, the loneliness, the isolation, the guilt, the shame, the brokenness, the addiction. You see it all, and yet you called us here. So, Lord, we thank you that you love us and that those things do not have the final say in our lives, but Jesus does. And so, Lord, by your authority, I declare Jesus king of this house, king of Great Oaks Fellowship, and king of our hearts. So, Holy Spirit, come, have your way, and do what only you can do. In Jesus' name. We all said together? All right. So, whenever I preach a series on thinking... Um, or fixing your thoughts and these types of things. I always pull out this story. So if you've heard it before, hopefully you like it because you're about to hear it again. If you haven't heard it, I'm going to feel super cool, okay? So either way, we win. But basically, I came across this article. This was several years ago. And I heard and I was reading about this article called The Ghost Army. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Ghost Army? What's that? No? Okay, then, dude, you're going to love this. This is so cool. It was a branch of the military in World War II, the army, okay? So the army, what they did is they didn't even, no one even knew they existed until like the late 90s. And the thing about the ghost army is they were known as a tactical deception unit, all right? And their only job as soldiers was to deceive the enemy, but how did they do that? Well, what the enemy or what the, what the army did is they recruited like these talented artists from universities during World War II going, hey, fancy pants, grab your pencil, you know, grab, grab your paint, you're coming to fight. And so they brought these artists in and they said, what we really need you to do is one thing. We need you to deceive the enemy. So we want you to create... Um, Props in so many words. We want you to create these props because what we feel is strategically, if we can create something that is believable, we can use it strategically to put them in certain territories that the enemy is wanting to take. So these artists got to work and they started creating these big inflatable tanks and they would paint, you know, tank stuff on them. Um, They would like get plywood and like make jeeps and airplanes and tanks, all the rest of this stuff. And then what they would do is once they kind of put this stuff together, it looked horrible up close. But from the air, it looked like there was this full army. So they would take these things and set them up in territories that were hotly contested by the enemy and with with the United States. And they would set them up and they would like poorly camouflage them. So when the enemy would fly over, they'd look down, they'd go, oh my gosh, where did all those guys come from? Look at all the tanks, look at all the artillery, look at all these things. And they would turn around and go back the other way. It's said that they, the ghost army has been credited with saving hundreds of thousands of American soldier lives just because they learned the art of deception. And what did they do? They didn't fire one bullet. All they had to do was just get into the head of their enemy. All they had to do is find a way to get here and to get them to see something that they thought was true that really wasn't. I think that's bad to the bone. I'm glad everyone else seems to agree as well. But here's my point. They had to learn how to get into the heads of their enemies. 
Once they were able to get into the heads of their enemies, they were able to put the, the battle of deceit upon their minds. And so because of that, they weren't able to take over territory like they had planned because they had been deceived. And the reason why I share this is because as we fix our thoughts, I got to tell you something. The devil is a master of deception. I want you to really hear this because I know that most of us in here are convinced that we know the truth about a lot of things, and we do in some ways. But don't be fully convinced right now because you actually may be leaving a lie that the devil says, you know enough. You, you have your beliefs. Don't let this guy start screwing these things up. You spent a lot of time reading and studying to get to this point. I'm just simply saying, the devil knows how to fight. And where he fights is on the battlefield of our mind. He's the master of deception. And don't ever forget the fact that the best lie always has an element of truth to it. Y'all with me? Y'all are leaned in and listening hard, ain't you? Okay. The reason why I bring this up is because as I was thinking about this throughout the course of the week, I, I, I pray with a lot of Christians who are worn out. And you may be one of them. And I get it. And I'm not here to judge you because you are. But I pray and I do a lot of ministry to Christians who are just tapped out, man. You're tired. The why, the reason, I mean, let's think about this. Why are so many Christian marriages falling apart at the same percentage as non-Christian marriages? What's going on? Right? I mean, think about the reason why so many of us are dealing with anger. We're dealing with anxiety. We're dealing with fear, doubt, brokenness. Um, I mean, you just go down the list. You know what your things are. We're struggling with these things, and I just got to ask the question, is this what God meant? Is this what it means to be saved? Is this what Jesus died to give us? Or could it be maybe we're losing battles that we shouldn't be losing? Could it be that maybe we're on the wrong battlefield? Could it be we don't even understand who our enemy is? And so yeah, I want you to take some great notes because I'm going to give you four things and five questions in two minutes. Here we are. No, I'm just kidding. We're not getting out in two minutes. I'm letting you know right now. But I'm going to do my best. But I got to tell you, this matters too much. So don't let the clock be king. Just please hear me out. Hear the word of the Lord today. In order for us to fix our thoughts, the first thing that we've got to do is we have got to know the real enemy. We have got to know the real enemy. And the reason why I say that is because, listen, I'm going to need you to trust me on this one thing. You're not going to want to believe, but I know you're going to, oh, no, no, hang tight. Your enemy is not your boss. He's not. See, this is where I already lost like a third of you, okay? And I understand why, because there's a face, there's an experience that you've had maybe with your boss. Your enemy is not your spouse. And there's the other 75% right there, the other two, you know, two thirds. Um, your enemy is not your spouse, guys. Your enemy is not your children. Your enemy is not your parents. It's not, it's not the person who's in the White House. Your enemy isn't the one who's running for the White House. Your enemy has, it's not a human being. We have to trust this. Because here's the thing, students, you're going to school tomorrow, and there's people in your lives that have been stirring up drama, talking smack about y'all, right? Messing up, like bullying you, whatever. Let me know who that is. I'll come and beat them up for you, bro. I don't even care. I'll show up to elementary, and I'll just handle some business for you, sir. And I love this kid. I love all of them over there. But right? But you got people in your life you're dreading seeing tomorrow because they're mean and ugly to you. So what the heck do you do? You go, that person feels like an enemy to me. I get it. All of us adults, can we relate to the fact that we also have people, just because you grow up doesn't mean those people go away. They just get more sophisticated and have more resources to be more ugly. That's what big people do, man. But here's the thing. Scripture says that your enemies are not flesh and blood. You go, well, what's that based on? Um, Ephesians 6, verse 12. Look at what it says. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of an unseen world. Students, adults, listen. Think about your house. 
Think about the arguments. Think about the slammed doors. Think about the ugly words that are coming out. Think about the thrown glass. Think about what's happening in your house and at your schools and at your places of work. You have to understand that those are only representations of what is actually taking place in the spiritual. Do you all follow what I'm saying? Where there is brokenness, where there's drug addiction, where there's crime, where there's just whatever those things are. I was talking to a dispatcher of a public school, and she, she's, she dispatches the, the school police, the whatever they are, and um, that's her full-time job. And this is what she said. I said, so I said, question, I said, is the crimes or the issues that the school, the North, North Independence, you know, Northside Independent School District, are the, is pretty much every school the same? She's like, no. I said, really? Tell me, what do you mean? She said, this school is known as the violent school. This school, and these are schools that we're sitting our kids to, by the way, this school is known as the weed school. This school is known for this. This school is known for that. She went down the list, and every single school had its own thing that it was known for. Guys, this is what it's, the Scripture is saying to us. Scripture is saying that there are strongholds, and those are reflections of strongholds that the enemy has established just in this one example. Do you follow? So it's not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and darkness, against mighty powers in this dark world. And our battle is against evil spirits in heavenly places. Now that's doing one of two things to you right now. Either you go, eh, that's interesting. Or you're going, okay, all right. So what am I supposed to do, David? Just get in the car and start swinging at demons? You know, just try to see if I can hit one? We're talking about fixing our thoughts. Could it be we've been fighting against ghost armies? These deceptions that the devil has set up to get us distracted, to lead us towards, and all of our energies and our efforts towards fighting ghost armies around us instead of the real enemy? Could it be all those arguments that you're having with your spouse? Could it be all the issues that you've got with that person? Could it be all the things that dominate your thoughts in your mind that you're trying to fix and correct and make to take care of? Could it be you're fighting a ghost army this whole time? You have to know the real enemy, and the real enemy is not you, and it's not me. Scripture says, Peter tells us this morning, this is your enemy. And we need to be aware and understand that this enemy is not here to play games with your life. Jesus said this enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy you. This enemy is a serpent, a poisonous serpent. And snakes do what snakes do. And these poisonous snakes, you can coddle them. You can put them in your bed. They may not bite you tonight. They may not even bite you tomorrow. But at some point, that that serpent is going to strike you with one goal in in mind, to kill and destroy you and eat you if they're big enough. And some of us, we have portals open in our homes of pornography, stuff that we allow on Netflix to come through our homes, the ways that we talk, the ways that we act, the secrets that we hold, the behaviors we exhibit. Those are access points for the devil to come in and do the very thing that the Scripture's talking about. Peter says, you better stay alert. You need to watch out, son and daughter of God. Why? He says, watch out for your great enemy. Go on and put that up, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion. This is the word of the Lord, and he's looking for someone to destroy and devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith, and remember that your family of believers all over the world are going through the same type of sufferings that you're going through this morning. So your situation is not unique. Your brokenness is not unique. What you're facing this morning is very common. Why? Because the enemy has three or four rusty old tools, but he knows how to use these weapons to do the job that he sets out to do. So what does that mean for a Christian then? Peter is saying, first off, you need to understand the character of a lion. What does a lion do when it gets hungry and needs prey? He doesn't look for the strongest one in the pack. What does he do? He goes after the weak one. He goes after the weakest one in the pack. Or, even better, he'll go after the one that's isolated over here, away from the pack. 
This is why it's so critical to get in church and get your family in this building and be under the teaching of God so we can be with one another in proximity. We need each other. We need to pray for one another. This isn't just a nice little holy gathering. We need this. We need this, and you need this. I need this. And so if you're watching online, we love you. We're so glad that you're joining with us, and we know that maybe proximity or circumstances can't keep, you know, won't allow you to come here physically. But there's some of y'all watching, and you're in your jammy pants, and you're only seven miles from this building, and you just don't want to get here because, oh, I don't know. I feel comfortable on the couch, and I'll just dwell. You need to get your butt in church because... And I say that in all Christian love. But if there's a real enemy that the Bible seems to be taken pretty serious, how serious are we taking it? If we're isolated, we are putting ourselves in a position to be devoured. Okay. Y'all with me? They're all with me because they're all here. The ones online, they're like, I don't believe in that. But that's okay. Know the nature of the lion is what I'm saying. And so scripture seems to say that your enemy... No, my name isn't in that verse. Your boss's name isn't in that verse. Your spouse's name. The devil is your enemy. Get this. And it's not like he just has bad feelings towards you. He wants to destroy you. I can't overstate that. He wants you to die. He wants to steal your dream. He wants to steal your destiny. He wants to do whatever he needs to do to be able to kill. Why? Because there's something valuable that he can steal from you that empowers him. He wants to take power away because he can't get it on his own. He's got to steal it. He's got to kill for it. He's, he's willing to destroy it because that power is so valuable. He's the master of deception. Next thing I would tell you is know the real enemy, but the next thing I would say to you is show up to, to the right battlefield. The truth is, is a lot of us are swinging and fighting hard on the wrong battlefield. Fighting the wrong enemies. Okay, well, maybe, maybe none of y'all deal with this, but do you ever just have those times where you'll just be minding your, your own business? Driving, taking a shower, just something completely brushing your teeth, and all of a sudden there's a situation that pops in your head. And then you begin to think about what they said, and then you're like, you're washing, you know, putting the soap on. You're like, oh, Oh, you know what? Mm, I'm gonna, I got a bone to pick with them. I'm gonna mind the gap, whatever it may be, and over spiritualize ugliness or whatever. And so you start thinking, you start arguing in your head. It's time for honesty hour here at Great Oaks Fellowship. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Where you're like, ooh, I would tell this person this. Ooh, and the man I hated when they said that. Oh, and if they do this, and if I show up here and they got that attitude, that this is what they're gonna hear, right? Do you see what I'm saying? You know what we're doing? We're fighting on the wrong battlefield. Your spouse doesn't clean the dishes like they said. You can't wait to come home, for them to come home. You've been practicing that speech for three hours since noon when you walked in there and saw those dirty coffee cups still on the nightstand. You're like, mmm. You're just prepared. They walk in through the door. You're like, mm. four score and seven years ago, right? And you were ready with your speech. Wrong battlefield, wrong enemy. Amen. I got one dude that said, yep. <laughs> but my point is, is if you're bitter this morning, if you're jealous hearted, if you're lustful, if you're angry, if you're manipulative, if you're judgmental, unforgiving, depressed, anxious, these doesn't mean that you're a big, fat, horrible person. But what it does mean is it may be an indicator. The reason why you can't get these thoughts and these patterns out of your head is because you need to fix your thoughts by getting on the right battlefield. You're on the wrong bat. You're swinging at the wrong ones. And so you're tired. And have you noticed just as soon as you get one person fixed, you got about 10 more that show up that you're going to have to now handle too? It's a never-ending cycle, and you're tired. It's because we're fighting the wrong enemies on the wrong battlefields. But let me tell you something. It doesn't have to be this way. So where's the battlefield? It's right here. Spoiler alert. It's in your head. This is where your battlefield is, guys. It's right above your shoulders sitting in your chair. That's where you're going to be doing the majority of your fighting. Amen? Amen. Okay. <laughs> then here's our problem. I think a lot of us Christians, we already know this. You're like, man, this is like a seventh grade sermon. I already know that the devil is the bad, mean guy. I get it. Right? These are horns. Um, 
I, Dan, I already know that the battlefield is the mind. I have Joyce Meyer's book. I got Greg Rochelle's book. Oh, I, got, I get it. It's about, okay, all right. Okay, it's one thing to know it, and it's another thing to show up on the right battlefield. But most of us don't show up dressed for the occasion. You ever heard that phrase, dress for success? Most of us walk right out of our beds without being dressed appropriately for battle. Look, the battle's going to come to you whether you want it to or not, y'all. So just because you don't want it to and wish it away, that's called la-la land. The battle's, he's coming to kill, steal, and destroy. He's looking for someone right now to devour. And what happens is there's too many Christians. We know he's the enemy, and we know where the battlefield is, but we show up on the battlefield in our SpongeBob jammy pants and a K-Love t-shirt, thinking we're there to show up to do something special, and we're just showing up barefoot, getting the sleep out of our eyes. Okay, let's do battle. You know, I could do all things that Christ would give me strength. There are less party. No. Paul says in Scripture, guys, this is for real. Let me remind you of something, students. Let me ri- remind you something, moms and dads and adults in here. Listen to this. Ephesians 6.12 says something. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in an unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That's where we're at right now. But as sons and daughters of God, I love how the Lord says, I'm going to pull the curtain back and allow you to see your battles and enemies from my perspective. How good is God for him to let us know this? We wouldn't know this otherwise. So then Paul says, well, then you got to dress for success. No soldier who has any hope of winning shows up barefoot with jammy pants on and the t-shirt. You show up prepared. You show up equipped, and this is what he says you got to put on. He says, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of what? Evil. Listen, whether you're rested, you're happy, you feel close to God, you feel a million miles away, I'm telling you, the battle's still going to show up. And as a matter of fact, the more confused and tired you are and he can get you, the more the battles will come. Then, however, if you get dressed for battle and you know who your enemy is, and you're showing up on the right battlefield, Scripture says that after that battle, you will actually, for once, start standing firm. You'll be the one, when the smoke clears, that you're still standing, and your enemy's defeated. The Bible says that we overcome the devil in Revelation by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. There is an active battle aspect. I think a lot of times we just go, I'm just going to hide behind Jesus and let him fight my battles. Well, sure, he's the King of kings, he's the Lord of lords. But scripture seems to suggest that you've got a role and you are a participant in this battle. You're in the battle whether you want to be or not because we still live in this broken world and the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy not only you but your children, your family, the generations that will follow in your bloodline. He wants to take everybody out. Y'all encouraged or scared? (laughs) Happy Halloween. Um... But once we're ready for battle, this is what the Bible says. So stand firm, Great Oaks Fellowship. Stand firm. Hold your ground. Having tightened, that's so random, having tightened the wide band of truth. What's the wide band of truth? Person, don't worry about it. it, What's the wide band of truth? Personal integrity. Moral excellence and courage. Put that around your waist and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, how do we put this stuff on? Where do we get it from? We go to the Father every day in the name of Jesus and say, Lord, would you please place your belt of truth around my waist? Because without your belt on me, my pants are going to fall. And I really want to make sure that I carry myself in a way that's dignified. I need to know the truth, and I need my my, my integrity to to be proper. I want to walk in righteousness. How do we get the breastplate of righteousness? Just push real hard and one pops out? No. He gives us his righteousness. But if you think about a breastplate, it's intended to protect you from here to here, meaning it protects your heart. His righteousness he gives that to you. 
And he puts that upon you. But then it goes on to say that once you've done that and have an upright heart, then you've strapped on your feet the gospel of peace and preparation, meaning don't forget the gospel in your life, which is why we take communion. Constantly remember Jesus paid it all. He defeated your enemies. Now he has positioned you by his spirit to also defeat the enemies in your life, knowing that they've already been defeated. You've got to walk in victory, though. If you don't walk in the victory he's given you, you will live in defeat. And how terrible is that to know that the war has been won for you but live as if you've lost it? Does that make sense? Okay, because it sure made sense in my mind. Remind yourself of the gospel. Then above all, lift up your protective shield of faith which can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So once you show up to battle, the devil doesn't go, oh, well, shoot, they're all dressed up and they're on the right battle. Oh, never mind, I'm scared. No, he's going to go, okay, game on. Boom, boom, come the fiery arrows of doubt, shame, old, old sins, trying to hit those old wounds in your life, doubt, fear, all the things, those fiery arrows are going to buy you. But when you have the shield of faith, the Bible says that that shield of faith, believing in what God says of you and what he has done on your behalf, you're able to withstand the fiery darts of the evil one and what he used to use for your destruction to attack you, you now are able to withstand it because you have faith in God, not in the power of that arrow. This is what it means to fight. And then take on the helmet of salvation. Let's not forget the battlefield is here. You need the helmet of salvation to put on your head. That protects you. And then the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. The Word of God. So know your real enemy. Start showing up to the right battlefields. Quit trying to fight with everybody and correct everybody and teach everybody a lesson. Stop that nonsense. You're wearing yourself out. Fight the real enemy. The person in front of you that's being ugly to you is not your enemy. There's a spirit behind it. So understand that. So if that's true, then get dressed for battle and use the type of weaponry and battle gear that allows you to have freedom and victory in your life. Don't you all just want to get a good night's sleep? How many of y'all need that in your life right now? Instead of up all night worrying and mad about stuff, angry, bitter, hurt, scared, freaked out, doubtful, we're all in here struggling on some level. The devil just hates the fact that I'm preaching this right now. But he's only going to hate it if you take it and apply it and believe it. And what he wants you to do is he wants you to go, man, we went late today, and that was a decent sermon from pastor. He always brings it. He's really, really good. <laughs> but that's what he wants. He wants you to get in the car, and he wants you to forget about this. So we're almost done, but I need you to really lean in because I want to see you all this time next year. I'm not joking. As a couple, I want to see you all next year free of anxiety and depression. I want to see you all next year walking in victory over that pornography addiction that's eating your freaking lunch. I want to see you walking in victory where you're no longer bound by bitterness and jealousy. I want to see a smile on your face that's for real. I want that for you because God wants that for you. So get dressed for battle and use the right weapons to fight the right enemy. Let's get really honest. When someone disrespects you this coming week, what weapon are you going to grab? Oh, oh, now, now we're all scared because we're like, the one that I always grab. Right, that's the problem. You show up on the wrong battlefield, use human weapons to do human battle, and it doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't solve anything. It makes things worse. You make it worse, okay? When someone hurts someone you love, what weapon do you grab? When you don't get your way, what weapon are you reaching for? See, do you see what I'm talking about? These are real issues because they're real pains. They're real frustrations. And there's typically real faces behind them. And what we want to do is we want to retaliate. We want to take revenge. We want to be able to put people in their place. I, I have the gift of speaking. I'm not good at most things. But the Lord has, this is a, this is a spiritual gift. I can sell. <laughs> I have people to bear witness to that. Pretty good. Um, but I, I'm a good salesperson. I, I know how to talk. I know how to convince people. 
Um, but I also know if you get me in the wrong situation and I'm walking in the flesh, this gift can be used for destructive purposes and I can slice people up quick. I can. I'm not saying look how cool I am, but each and every one of you has a spiritual gift. And if it's misused, we can get on the battlefield and hurt a lot of people instead of honoring the Lord. And so my point is this. We got to start using our weapons, the one that God's given us for his glory and not our own and be able to understand that we do not fight as humans do. Second Corinthians explains this. Even though we're human, we no longer wage war like humans do. So if your response is to be ugly, to shut that person up, to get in their face, to be passive aggressive, to be ugly, whatever it may be, you're reaching for human weapons and you must stop. Because now you're just fighting, you're bringing more destruction than you are good and you'll be the one who pays for it the most. You see, 2 Corinthians says, use God's mighty weapons now, sons and daughters of God, not worldly weapons to knock down the strongholds of, look at this, human reasoning and false arguments. Where, do the, where does the human reasoning and false arguments hit? Right here in our heads. So we gotta stop reasoning our way. We have to stop allowing these arguments, these false arguments to position themselves to destroy us. We don't fight against those things on our own weapons anymore. You will lose every time. So there's two weapons before we get out of here that the, the word of God says is you have got to learn how to use and employ against the enemy. You wanna know what the first weapon is? The Bible. You're like, straight up, dude, for real, man. You're going to tell me just to read the Bible? Oh, big time. Big time. Let me tell you, let, let me tell you, this is, this is a big deal. I think this is probably the most important part of the whole sermon, what I'm about to share with you right now. I hear so often that the enemy has convinced a lot of his sons and daughters in here, the Bible's boring, man. Like, I... I I wish I could read it like you do, Pastor David, but I, when I read it, I just want to go to sleep. I get bored out of my mind. I get that. David, I, I don't have time to read the Bible. Do you know how much schoolwork I've got? Do you know how many kids I'm trying to raise? Do you, dude, I'm working 12 hours a day. I got a lot of things on my mind, and you're telling me I got to sit down and read a book. for. And I know it's good, but I, that's why I come to you on Sundays. I'm not your Bible, y'all. I preach the Bible, but guess who has to open up in the middle of the week to preach it? So here's my point. Consider the subtle tactic. You, you, most of us haven't seen what the point I'm making yet. It's boring. I don't have time. Don't understand it when I read it. You know what the enemy's just done? He showed up with a reasoning your reasoning, you think it's your thoughts. Do you see how deceptive he is? Why would he want to keep you from reading the Bible if there's nothing to it? Because he knows once you put the Word of God in your hand and you learn how to use the Word of God, now you're a threat. You want to know the other weapon we have that we've been told that we have to be victorious? You ready for this one? As a pastor, a friend of mine says, this is going to blow your hat in the creek. Prayer. Oh, dude, I stayed late for Bible and prayer. Yes, yes, you did. Yes, you did. What are the two biggest things in your life as a Christian you struggle with to do the most? Is there anything else? No. Don't have time to pray? David, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to say. David, I, I, I mean, I've prayed before and it never works. Anybody ever said, feel that way? Man, I've said all I know to say and it just doesn't work anymore. It doesn't, I, I'll have you pray for me, but I'm not, okay. Let's, let's, let's reverse back. Huh. You're convinced that you, your prayers don't work. You're convinced that you don't even know how to do it. You're convinced that it's really not worth your time because you're busy and you are. Vain reasonings. You've been deceived. 
You've been deceived, son and daughter of God. The battlefield of your mind, you've allowed the ghost army to convince you to keep you from reading God's word and praying. When God's word says these are your two most mightiest weapons to overcome the enemy in your life, to fix your thoughts so that you can walk in victory. Thank you, Jenny Broadnax. If it was just for you, my sister. Do y'all feel convicted? I pray you do. I straight up pray you feel super convicted, not condemned, but convicted. Because you, if you have someone who's not in the word of God on a daily basis, not out of obligation, but not in the word of God on a daily basis and not praying on a daily basis, I can show you a Christian that is losing on the battlefield. I mean, it's that simple. You show me someone who's not in the word of God and not praying on a consistent basis, I can promise you their marriages are starting to crumble. I can promise you their kids are acting a nut. They already do it anyway, even when you're doing both these things. Amen? All right, no, I'm just, all right. Um, But do you know what I'm saying? I can promise you your life is not put together. You're struggling. It's because you're not in the word of God. You don't know how to use the sword and you don't understand how to use the power of prayer. The devil has convinced you it's not worth your time when that's the very thing. Look, when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted, I'm almost done. When he was tempted, do you remember what happened? The devil showed up like a roaring lion because that's who he is. And what did he intend to do? He came to steal, kill, and destroy the calling and the anointing of Jesus. For what purpose? So that we would be people still imprisoned by Satan himself. So Jesus is out there and he's in a place of weakness. He's isolated. Do you see the tactics? They're very predictable. Jesus is by himself. He's in a weakened state. This is when the devil shows up. He begins to tempt Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He went out to the wilderness to do something, to fast and to pray. As this happened, the devil showed up and said, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God. And what did Jesus do? He didn't say, hey, you big idiot. I'm the one who made the universe. Get, get the heck out of here, bonehead. No, Jesus quoted the word of God back to him. He understood the sword of the Lord. And he prayed and he overcame the devil by the word of the Lord. So let me ask you, Christian, before we get out of here. If Jesus relied upon the word of God and the power of prayer to resist temptation so that he would not be devoured, so that he could step into his full purpose, why do you think you're stronger than Jesus to overcome the attacks of the devil? To go, I don't need to read the Bible. I don't need to pray. It's not my thing. You're stronger and better than Jesus. Is that what we're saying this morning? That's what you're saying by your inaction. I say this with love, but I'm putting it to you straight because I'm afraid some of you who don't hear what I'm telling you right now, you're not going to be in this room this time next year. I feel that very strongly. Hear the word of the Lord. Then you go, dude, how do I fight with the word of God now that you've scared me and you've spoken all these horrible things over my life? Okay, cool. Here, that, that's right where we need to be. You know, God's word says something. He says, for example, when the enemy says to you, you're weak and you'll always be weak, did you know that you can fight back with the word of God? This is what this looks like. This isn't a bunch of hocus pocus stuff where you have to go to seminary. No, you could fight back with the truth and say no. As a matter of fact, according to Isaiah 40 verse 31, God says that I'm strong. So I'm going to stand on this truth. (laughs) You've just sliced the enemy on the right battlefield. When the enemy, oh no, when the enemy suggests to you that you're a failure, like many of us in here are struggling, feeling deep down inside, you're a failure. You can refute the enemy's lies on the right battlefield with the sword, and you go, no, according to Romans 8, 37, I am more than a conqueror. Okay? When the enemy tells you, you are rejected. You'll always be rejected. No one wants you. You can go, no, I fight back with the truth. And according to the word of God, I could say, no, according to Ephesians 1, 6, I am accepted. That's what the Bible says of me. And I'm going to stand on what is true 
and not what you try to deceive me by with this ghost army. I'm kicking these things over. There's nothing behind them. The enemy cannot stand against the word of God. You can go on to say, listen, you are not important. You hear the devil. You ain't important. You ain't special. You have nothing to offer. You go, no, nope, that's not true because Deuteronomy 7, 6 explains that I am God's treasured possession. Now, guys, this is either true or it's not, but if God says this of you, you got to start trusting his word before you can use it. This is the reality for each and every one of you in here under the banner of Jesus. You know that, right? When the enemy tries to say, listen, man, no one likes you. David's only nice to you because he's paid to be nice to you. That is not true for most of you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, you fight back. I love y'all. And you say, no, Psalm 17 says that I'm the apple of God's eye. No, no, that's not true, for it is written. When the enemy tells you that you're a victim, you'll always be a victim. Someone's always going to get in front of you to get the thing that you want that they get to first. No, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 17, Satan in Christ, I'm victorious. I'm not a victim. I'm not a victim of my circumstances. God commands my destiny according to Scripture. Next time the enemy tells you you're always going to be alone, even though you're in a crowd of people and you sleep to someone next to someone in your bed, you're alone, you're alone. You go, no. According to Joshua 1, 5, he, God says that I'm never alone and that he will never leave me, he will never forsake me, and he will go wherever I go. Do you see how this works? When the enemy tries to convince you that you're ugly, you have nothing to offer, no one would ever find you appealing, you go, no, according to Psalm 45, 11, God says that I'm beautiful. He defines my beauty, not some dumb boy on Instagram. I'm only saying that as a dad. When the enemy tells you that you're rejected, you'll always be rejected, you go, 1 John no, 3, 1 says, God loves me so much he adopted me as his child. He hasn't rejected me, that's a lie. When the enemy, can I, can I give you two more before we get out of here? When the enemy says he tries to discourage you by saying you will never be healed of that, you go, no. As a matter of fact, according to Isaiah 53, 5, Scripture says that not only does he, he is he Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals my body, but according to Isaiah 53, 5, it says that by his stripes even my soul has been healed. I think he can handle my flesh if he can heal my soul. When the enemy tries to tell you you're worthless and you're unworthy, you go, no. You go to John 3, 16. For God so loved me that he sent you, the only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would never die but have everlasting life. And so, no, I'm worth something to the Lord, and I am not rejected. I'm not a victim. I'm an overcomer. Do you see how this works? The devil doesn't have a leg to stand on. Now, here's the thing. There are some battles in your life that you're going to continue to fight over and over and over again, and you're going to try to get discouraged because you're going to go, I thought I fought this battle before. You may fight it for the rest of your life, but at least you know what to do when you show up to that battle again. But it just shows how valuable that one area of your life is to the devil that he keeps coming back trying to take it. All right. So pray. All right. Take, take your phones out really quickly. We're done. But I'm going to give you these five things because, guys, the battle is here. The battle is now. The moment you get in the car, the battle's going to be happening. And your temptation is to begin to see throughout the course of the week people that you need to fight against. And just remember what my big mouth said in the name of Jesus. You're fighting the wrong enemy on the wrong battlefield. Start showing up to the right battlefield. So here's how to fight right. Take a picture of the screen because you're going to need it, I promise. Ask the question first off, am I separating the person from the spirit that's behind this person's words and actions? And you can look up these verses on your own time that support these questions. Am I on the right battlefield? Ask yourself that question. Am I dressed for battle? Or did I show up in my underwear today? Next one, am I using the right weapons to fight? Lastly, Am I fighting my enemies by my own power or by the power of the Holy Spirit? Scripture says that we do not fight by our might nor by our power, but by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in you. You are an overcomer. Revelation says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And I believe today that if you take these words to heart and you begin to pick up your word, whether you understand it or not, whether prayer is boring to you or not, you get after it. 
Because I can tell you those are two lies that are keeping you in, in, in bondage right now. You begin to put those things in action in your life and you will begin to see victory in your life and you will learn how to fix your thoughts. Before we get out of here, none of this applies to you if you've never accepted Jesus in faith for your salvation. And I know that seems like a really weird left turn and kind of a bummer. But the truth is, is the reason why we can preach this way and the reason why we can have this hope is because Jesus has given it to us. So how do you get it? The Bible says that anybody that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You need your sins forgiven. He's got to defeat the, the power of sin in your life. You can't do that. That is a battle that only he can win and fight, and he has already won for you. Your sin separates you from God this morning, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can get a new God, Jesus Christ. So if you want to exchange your old life for the new life of Jesus, ask him right now. And this is what we do every single Sunday. We give people an opportunity to do this. So if you want to get saved, if you want to be made right with God, if you want to see victory in your life, ask for it right now. Pray with me. Just tell him in faith, dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. But right now, with the faith that you've given me, I put it in you. Tell him in faith. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead on the third day. And I'm asking you to save me. Cleanse me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I make you the Lord and boss of my life. In Jesus' name. And if you just prayed that prayer, you just got saved. Your battle has been fought and won by Jesus on the cross. And I believe some of you in here prayed that prayer for the first time. If you did, I'm gonna ask you at the count of three to raise your hand so we could put a Bible in your hand and celebrate your decision. One, two, three. If you just prayed that, put your hand up super high in this room right now. Come on, let me see it. Who is it? Who's shy in here? We've got some shy folks in here. All right. Well, you know what? Stand to your feet. I really... I preach every sermon from my heart, but I feel that this is a very time-sensitive sermon for some in here because you're in the battle of your life right now and there are, there's darkness trying to overtake you. But you are more than conquerors through Christ who loves you. So would you let us then know how to, we can pray for you and support you and cheer you on. I want to thank you for your patience today, but I want you to feel like you've just been to church. <laughs> And I feel like we did church today. I think that we did exactly what God wanted us to experience today. And we're able to participate in that. See you tonight, 6 o'clock. Pray for Israel. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.